Eagles Entertainment. Welcome, Eagles, everywhere to the Eagles Insider Podcast, presented by Lincoln Financial Group. I'm Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro, and welcome to April, the critical month in the NFL's offseason. Great times ahead for the Eagles, who, of course, have 11 draft picks in this 2021 NFL draft. We will talk about that in the show. NFL insiders Adam Kaplan and Ross Tucker provide their perspectives to the trade the Eagles made a couple of weeks ago, moving from number six in round one to number 12, gaining a fourth round pick at the exchange of a fifth round pick, and adding a 2022 first round draft pick from the Miami Dolphins. So many conversations about that deal. What does it mean? We'll find out when Adam and Ross join the show. The NFL announcing last week that a 17-game schedule is in the offing for 2021. Yay! That means more Eagles football. Takes the snap. He's looking. He fires. Complete! Touchdown! Eagles win! And as NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell said, could be, hopefully, fingers crossed, plans being made, full stadiums in September. We sure hope so. So we look forward to a season with 17 regular season games, three preseason games, and Eagles roster absolutely in transition. I don't know how many times I have to say that. I mean, I've been saying it all off season. It is very well known around the Novacare complex. The Eagles are going to rebuild through the draft with 20 selections over the next two drafts. That is a tremendous opportunity. Everyone acknowledges that. Also in today's show, we will meet with Joe Flacco, who comes back, raised in Audubon, New Jersey, went to University of Pittsburgh, then to the University of Delaware, a first-round draft pick by the Baltimore Ravens. And he played 11 seasons there, won a Super Bowl, was a Super Bowl MVP, was very briefly the highest-paid quarterback in the NFL. So Joe Flacco... Played 11 years with Baltimore, then he goes to Denver for a season, then the Jets last year, and now he's in Philadelphia with the Eagles. So we look forward to talking with Joe one-on-one in just a bit. Let's begin the podcast right here, though, with the running backs coach. Now, throughout the offseason, we've been giving you exclusives as I have a chance to interview the new coaching staff. Not necessarily about the players on the roster, but about what their beliefs are in the coaching game. And today it's Jamal Singleton, running backs coach, who had a terrific career as a back at Air Force. He's been coaching for the last 20 years, most recently with the Cincinnati Bengals the last couple of seasons, overseeing a really talented and productive group of running backs. And now he's in Philadelphia. He's got Miles Sanders and Boston Scott and Richard Huntley and Who knows who else? I certainly would expect the Eagles to add to the running back group, perhaps very significantly in this draft. Who knows? Anyway, let's begin right here, one-on-one with running backs coach Jamal Singleton. Hi, Jamal. Uh, Good to see you. Um, Haven't met you yet, but nice to see you. Welcome to Philadelphia. Uh, (laughs) I got to start with your bio is very interesting. We don't have a lot of coaches who were born in Turkey and who lived the life uh, as a son of a, an Air Force sergeant. So before we talk about football, what were your life experiences like growing up, and what parts of the world did you get to know? Well, you know, uh, being a military brat, to be honest, for me was was just a phenomenal experience. I mean, you mentioned I was born in Turkey. That's uh, where my dad was stationed over there. Uh, my mother was British. Um, actually, they met when my dad was stationed previously in England, and so I spent a lot of my life in Britain. So about 10 years of my life, I've got a my whole mom's side of the family is over there. I've got an older brother, nieces, nephews, all that good stuff. I um, got to live in Germany for two and a half years, which is a pretty neat experience as I was younger um, growing up. And, and really for a, lo- a large part of my life and earlier was spent overseas. I'd lived overseas more than I lived in the U.S., so it was great. I mean, I've got to see some things that that you read about in history books and got to go some places that were, were pretty impressive. So I, I enjoyed my upbringing and, and growing up and traveling around the world and and then coming back to the U.S. when my dad retired. At what age did the game of American football 
come across your radar? You know, it's that's people kind of forget sometimes that even when I was living overseas, we lived on base. So it was all American kids and going to American schools. And we had a the youth center sports program there. So I started playing football really early as a, as a kid and was playing flag football in Germany. Um, started playing tackle football when I was seven, when we were actually in the in Texas. So it's kind of been a part of my life from from day one. So, OK, so I have an interesting question. Do you think the game of football, which we love in America more than anything, will ever be a dominant global sport? Like, will Europe embrace it and understand it? I know they had, we've had NFL Europe. We tried that. I, do kids play it over there? Like, do you think that it, someday that we will replace the NFL, will replace the beautiful game in the world? No, I, I think that might be hard. I think that might be hard for, for us to take over soccer um, over there. But I, I think the sport has grown year in and year out. I remember when I was a kid, the first NFL game I ever got a chance to see was at Wembley Stadium. It was an exhibition game when I was a little kid back then. Well, now you've, we've got the whole London series where we're playing over there and all those games are sold out. So there's definitely a place for for American football over in Europe. And I think there's, the fan base is, is growing with, you know, the internet and social media and, and all those type of things that they're a little bit more active. But to see it replace, so I, I don't see that, but I could see, I could see us maybe having a team in England. It, it could be something. It's definitely grown in popularity. I just think it's such a hard game to learn. Stopping, starting, soccer is flowing, and you know, it's just, I don't know. You know, you, you've you've been part of it your whole life. I just wondered if maybe people around you who weren't, do you, do you find you, it's just a difficult game to learn for people who aren't born into it. Um, it is a little bit. I mean, you, when you look at the rules and you've hit the big point, there's a lot of downtime. You know, when you really look at how much action is actually going on is different as Americans. We've enjoyed that. The commercials, the the tailgating, the, all that part of it. It's it's just more of our fabric, more of us as as a culture, whereas, you know, overseas in Europe, there there's some different cultural things that go on. But definitely I don't see it replacing it, but I can see the fan base. being. there's more kids playing it in England and over overseas than there have been I think any other time in history but uh it's it's still going to be I think more of an American thing for us. Jamal let's talk about you as a football player you played at Air Force what took you to Air Force was it the military thing was it uh the style of football you know they run the football you're a running back kind of a great fit. You know, it's it's kind of a funny story I hate kind of saying this but you know being a military brat my dad was in the Air Force I didn't even know the Air Force Academy existed. I didn't know they had a football team. Um, it was just, you would think I would, but I didn't. It was probably my junior year, just started getting recruiting letters for them. And I remember going home and say, hey, did y'all know Air Force has a football team? And, <laughs> and it just kind of started it. And, you know, it was something that for me, you know, a chance to get a great education, um, chance to play Division One college football. I didn't have a whole lot of Division One offers, but that was one of them. And and I just thought, you know, it it meets everything that I'm looking for. I'm looking for big time football. I'm looking for a great education, and it just seemed like the perfect fit. I wasn't afraid of the military lifestyle, having grown up in it. Um, so it was definitely something that when it came about, I was like, you know what, this this could be a good place for me. You were a two time captain there, so you're accustomed to leadership, to being a leader. Is that something, Jamal, that came naturally to you? Um, I, I don't know if I'd say it came naturally. I think there's probably some skill sets that I had and learned growing up that, that kind of lended to that. I think at the end of the day, there's there's a lot of leadership by example that goes on, and I think that's first and foremost. But I've just been fortunate to, to build a good camaraderie with teammates and players, and I think that was part of the reason that I was was voted a team captain two years. Do you look for leadership in your room and do you think that leaders are the best leaders are born leaders or do they develop those skills? Um, I, th I think one of the things that sometimes gets confused is charisma with leadership. And, and I think charisma is one of those born with traits that, you know, guy that can lead other people and talk to other people. But it's not always that you have to have charisma to be a leader. And it's not always if you have charisma, you are a leader. So I think Leadership is a learned trait. There are certain things that you have to be able to do as a leader. And I think there are certain ways to communicate with people that allow that to happen. Now, I think there are also some skill sets that you're born with that can lend you to being a leader. But it's it's a common thing. I'd say both 
if you ask me that, it's you can be born with it and you can train guys to do it. And I think leadership comes in a lot of different styles. And that's something that I've learned in a running back room is you don't always have to be a vocal leader. You don't always have to be the rah-rah guy. You can be a little bit more stoic. You can be a little bit more lead by example um, that, that comes into play. So there's a lot of different styles of leadership that you can see come across in a room. Why did you get into the world of coaching? <laughs> Again, a, a little bit of a funny story. I, my whole time at the academy, my goal, I was going to be a pilot. I decided I wanted to fly A-10s. It's the tank of the sky. I just thought it was one of the toughest, meanest, big Gatling gun blowing up tanks on the ground. I thought that was exactly what I wanted to do. And my first year after I graduated, I was taking my introductory to flight training, just learning how to fly Cessnas. But I was also coaching down at our prep school. So the Air Force Academy has a prep school on campus. So I went down there and was assistant head coach and office coordinator and started just coaching my first year. And I, just being honest, I fell in love with it. And it was like, you know, this flying thing's pretty cool, but gosh, I'm very passionate about this coaching. And that, and it was at that point that really I decided I was going to give up my pilot slot, which at the time was a 10-year commitment. So um, I knew if I tried to fly in coach, it probably wasn't going to happen. But uh, I remember the first guy I talked to when I decided I wasn't going to fly anymore and I wanted to kind of chase coaching at some point was Fisher DeBerry. And uh Fortunately, he ended up giving me my first job as a coach as well, too. So really just fell in love with the game as a player playing it. And then when I got a chance to coach, realized that, yeah, I can't live without this game in my life. I have this weird theory about running backs. They, they get just destroyed, right? They, they, they touch the ball all the way through their youth football days. They get the ball all the time in high school. A lot of times they get the ball a ton in college. So by the time they reach the NFL, it's very difficult to maintain their bodies and to have – longevity in their careers. So I'm going to throw a crazy idea to you. Tell me what you think of it. Limit the number of touches a running back can get through high school. And is that possible? Does that make any sense? I mean, like how, how can we make running backs last longer? And I'm, I'm, I know that running backs are near and dear to your heart. Um, so, so you're talking about a pitch count for running backs. That's what you want to put in. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, pretty, pretty neat. I'm, I don't know. I, and I think part of it is just the physicality of the position itself. I'm not sure if you can really say that because of the amount of contact and stuff that happened to them when they're younger years, that that's why they don't have the longevity in NFL. And I will say this, don't forget now, I coach Frank Gore. So Frank Gore has obviously found the fountain of youth and he gets it. And I don't think he was ever in a pitch count. And even Marshawn Lynch, when I was with him, is a, a, an older player that's played. But it's just when you look at the position in itself, and it's one of the few positions maybe other than offensive line where – Literally, you're getting hit in one way, shape, or form on every single play, whether you're initiating the contact or somebody else is initiating the contact. So it's just the position in itself requires explosiveness, it requires size, strength, all these things that come into play. And it's it's just tough. It's tough on the human body to to put go through that punishment and and have those things happen. So it's a little bit a little bit tougher. I don't know if what you change what they did as a kid, because we I think there's guys that have played the game that maybe didn't didn't play as much in youth sports and there's I think that whole there's parents that haven't had their kids play youth I don't think that really changes it at the end of the day if you've got a big huge D lineman hitting you square in the chest I think that's gonna take its toll no matter what you've done before that point so you just have to be a freak like Frank Gore and Marshawn Lynch or like do they do things that <laughs> to protect their bodies that you've seen that are above and beyond and far and away you know greater than a lot of other running backs I mean how do you speak to their longevity and other guys who, my gosh, the Gale Sayers of the world who didn't last long? Of course, they had a bunch of injuries, but um, it's crazy, right? Like Frank yeah. Gore, you know, that's a great, the great point. Guy's been around forever. And he's still doing it. He's still doing it. You know, it's and if you look at Frank in college, you would have never thought that the guy that probably would play longer than any person at his position would be him. I mean, he had two ACL surgeries, two knee surgeries in college. You would have never thought he'd be the most durable player. But again, he works at it. He works at it and he trains and he prepares his body and all those type of things to give him a chance to be able to do that. And I think fortunately for him, because of those things that he's done and how hard he works, he's been, I, won't, I hate to say lucky, but I think there is definitely some luck that comes with it in the position of not suffering any major injuries or, or anything like that at his age. But it's again, it's it's tough. There's going to be guys that are going to go four to five years, maybe guys at six to seven. But I like to say it's the toughest position on the field. Yeah. You've coached in a bunch of different systems. 
You've had success all over. Are there commonalities that translate that you must have to have success running the football? Um, I think in a room, you got to have a guy that can is pretty elite at doing it. I mean, that's the, the first thing coming from my room. But we know, and that's the great thing about this game is it takes all 11 on the field at the time. It takes receivers blocking. We see those big runs. It takes those big guys up front, all five of them, you know, taking care of their job. It takes a quarterback who's a threat throwing the ball and playing good action. So it's, it's just having that team effort and understanding that, yeah, while the running back may be the guy that's got the ball in his hands at that time, Time, there's so many maybe even more important things going on around him so it's just just being able to develop that and having that that cohesion of how you want to run the football and there's a lot of ways to do it whether it's a downhill physical game whether it's a spread out kind of zone running scheme there's a lot of different way I will say this that I know for a fact a, a mobile quarterback that is a threat to run the ball as well is always a great addition in the run game because it slows your number now you got one less guy because he's got to be accounted for the running back or for the quarterback when in most cases that's the one guy they negate from running so having an athletic quarterback that's able capable of running is is a big part of that as well could you explain to me why it works so well at air force and and, and how you would describe that scheme and could that possibly work in the nfl does the nfl take some of what schools like air force does and and, and apply that in this league you know, I always laugh because the triple option is for a lot of years has kind of gotten a, I won't say a bad rap, but nobody wants to be called a triple option guy. Hey, I'm a triple option guy because it takes you back to the, the old school days and all that. But I think if you really look closely, the majority of the schemes and the way they do it is the same at a lot of places. They've just changed the location of the quarterback. Instead of him being under center and the back being right behind him, now they've put him in the gun and you're seeing all the zone read. I mean, you can't tell me that Baltimore isn't running triple option on a lot of occasions with those. So a lot of those schemes are the same. And it's like anything. It's like all football. It goes around now. Will we ever get into the bone or to the broken bone like Fisher to Barry kind of created way back when? I don't think it ever gets to that point. But schemes of the triple option and the quarterback run game are all throughout football today. It's just the service academies are the ones that truly do it traditionally, truly that's what they run about. And it's a complex offense. And I think the type of players that you get at a service academy lends itself for the physicality of it, as well as the intelligence of it. Jamal, you mentioned Frank Gore, you mentioned Marshawn Lynch, two players who have, you've had great success with. Are there others that have really helped you have great success and that you've helped them have great success? Well, I mean, I think anytime you walk into a room as a coach, there's going to be some give and take. There's going to be some learning. And, and I always feel that as much as I give players and help them learn the game, I'm taking just as much away from them. I've had a lot of different different guys that I've been able to coach, been been fortunate. I mean, you you mentioned Frank Gore and Marshawn Lynch. I mean, it, at Cincy, I had Joe Mixon, who's a phenomenal player. I had Giovanni Bernard, you know, also there. Then I go, I had Doug Martin, I had Jalen Richard. I've just had a lot of different types of backs. And, and then even in college, you know, my first, really my first running back I ever coached was Chad Hall. And Chad Hall is now the receivers coach for the Buffalo Bills. So there's, you know, I've just been fortunate. I've probably taken a lot more from the guys in my room than I've given them. But I, I think it's it's been that part of it. It's, it's building that relationship and us basically getting better together and me learning different ways to present information to a guy that he can kind of understand it. And I think Frank's a perfect example. You know, as long as he's been in the league, there's his, we still keep in touch. And there's things that I helped him with that he – so, hey, coach, hey, I did that thing we talked about two years ago and it worked. And it's, you know, just that give and take that you make. But I've, I've been fortunate. I really have with the rooms that I've been able to be a part of. Have you made um, pass catchers out of guys who, when you first looked at them, you went, I, I don't know how it's going to work with their hands or their instincts or their discipline in running routes or just their comfort level catching the football? You know, I think, you know, ball skills is a little bit of that. You kind of have it. You can get better at it, obviously, but there's guys that are just natural ball catchers. I also know that like route running for running backs, 
in general, hasn't always been a big push for them. They, maybe they didn't do it in high school. They were just getting handed the ball. They weren't asked to run routes. So the route development piece is something that I always try to work with backs to, to put them in that position. I try to tell them, hey, if we're going to line up in wide receiver spots, we need to do wide receiver things and truly truly try to teach them routes based on that. I think probably Jalen Richard is a guy that I work with at Oakland that had a chance and he kind of became our third down receiver out of the backfield and just got better Giovanni Bernard again kind of helping him with some of his route things so I'm ex- always excited about that where you just there's a little bit more to the position than people sometimes give it credit and I think you know coaching a back to be able to run routes how he runs his choice routes out the backfield and then extending them and getting matched up with safeties and linebackers and being effective in that I, I really I enjoy that part of the position and part of the coaching and hopefully helping guys get better at that part of it as well. All right, let's play pretend. I'm Miles Sanders. I'm Boston Scott, et cetera. Um, I- I'm wondering, I-, I don't know you. I haven't had a chance to really get to know you. I'm looking forward to being in the room with you. What do I need to know about you and your approach to coaching that running back's room? Well, I think first off, you better just know I love this game. I, I-, I love it. I-, I-, I joke that I haven't worked a day in my life ever since I've been coaching football because it is, and I enjoy it. And, and it's, I'm going to come to work with that passion and that energy to do that. So if I'm going to come that way, I'm going to expect you to match it a little bit. So coming in the room, be that guy. Don't be a guy that's an up and down guy. Be a guy that is consistent, that every single day, they're going to know who I'm going to be. They're going to know how I'm going to come in the room. They're going to know how I present because I'm going to consistently do that. Well, I'm going to ask them to do the same thing. You know, sometimes we got to leave some stuff at the front door before we walk in the room and put our minds where we're at. Chuck Pagano used to always say, be where your feet are. And I I'd always kind of put that in my coaching. So we're going to have fun. <laughs> we're going to have a, a great time. We're going to know how to work. We're going to be physical and all those things that that you need from a back. But I just to, to know that we can be passionate about what we do and we can enjoy it and we can have fun doing it and still be successful and all that. And hopefully that means your backs score a lot of touchdowns. So <laughs> last one for you, Jamal. What was your signature move after scoring a touchdown? And what do you want to see from your running backs when they <laughs> score touchdowns? Well, well, I didn't play in the NFL, so I couldn't really celebrate in college. Yeah, and you still a, scored a lot of touchdowns. Yeah. Yeah. Being a being an Air Force Academy guy, I've all we always had a saying: celebrate with your brothers. Because obviously, if you made it to the end zone, there's a reason why. Yeah, I'm sure you played a big part of it, but those other guys were it. I, I always like to just turn around and run back to my old line guys and just kind of hug and, and just just part of it. So I'd love, I'd really love to see because I'm a little bit old school. I'd love to see a guy score a touchdown, <laughs> hand the ball to the official, and go celebrate with their teammates. That's what I'd yeah. like to see. Act like you've been there before. <laughs> hey, Barry Sanders was there a whole lot of times, and you saw how he responded. <laughs> hey, Jamal, thank you very much, man. Great stuff. Great to know you. Looking forward to meeting you in person at the Novacare Complex, and thanks for your time. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, Dave. Appreciate it. And now let's go to the quarterback position, Joe Flacco. He's here to provide competition, add depth. You'll notice the Eagles have not gone out of their way saying, hey, Jalen Hurts is going to be our starter. No, no, no. He's got to earn it. So Flacco's mentality, of course, is to come in and do what he can do to help the football team. If that means he's winning the starting quarterback job, well, so be it. Joe Flacco is here in his hometown looking for a big 2021. The Eagles bringing Joe Flacco into town, one-year contract for him. To come into the Eagles quarterback room and compete, add some depth, and should be fun to watch Joe in this Eagles offense. Hello, everyone. I'm Eagles insider Dave Spadaro, joined by Joe Flacco, newest member of the Philadelphia Eagles. Joe, um, you met the media earlier, and there were a lot of questions, of course, about coming back to Philadelphia. It didn't seem like it was going to be that big a deal for you, just from the sense of you grew up in the area and now you're coming back to Philly. Can you kind of elaborate on that? And I mean, you've seen everything in your career. What is this moment like for you? I'm excited about it. And listen, I mean, it's tough for somebody like me uh, to show my excitement. It's just not who I am. But I think it's going to be a really cool opportunity. I'm excited about being home. Um, I know there is a lot of excitement, a lot, you know, amongst my close friends and family about it. Um, so it's going to be a pretty cool opportunity. Joe, 14 years in the NFL. What has been the key to success? What advice would you have for young players who think that once they make it in the league, they're going to stay forever? 
Well, you just got to keep going. You can't ever get comfortable or think that you're comfortable in what you do. Um, you got to keep working and keep getting better and, and just keep your head down and, like I said, keep going. You know, there's going to be a lot of, you know, obstacles along the way, and you just got to keep going through them and, and, and hope that they teach you something along the way and that you come out the, the other end on, you know, better better because of it. Um, so I think that's what you try to do for the most part, and that's what I've done, and uh, we'll, we'll see where it continues to take me. Has the quarterback position in your mind, and you look around the league, has it changed since you got into the league? Well, I, th- I think a lot of the view is that it has changed a little bit, and I think the game of football always changes and evolves to certain things. Um, uh, you know, defenses get different. You know, the the skill positions and, you know, sizes of different players at different positions and how people like to attack people all change a little bit. And, um, you know, obviously I think you've seen, um, you know, a little bit of evolution of what the quarterback does. But at the same time, um, a lot of it's very similar. And, you know, just to point out, you know, there's Tom Brady out there winning his seventh Super Bowl. Uh, and, you know, he's been doing it longer than any of us. So, Joe, early in your career, great success. I mean, Super Bowl champion, Super Bowl MVP, playoff victories. What changes in your mind as, as you go from the regular season to the postseason? Is the game different? Well, I think there's parts of it that are different. Um, but when you're used to playing in tight, uh, you know, hard-nosed football games all year, um, like I think that we were given kind of the advantage to in Baltimore most of my career there, we played in a lot of really important games that that had a lot on the line. And I think those prepared you for those types of games that you were going to have to play in January and then in February if you wanted to win the Super Bowl. Um, so I think there is a little bit of a difference between certain games, but um, I think when you're a you know, when you're a tested team and when you've been through a lot, um, they're not too big for you and they end up being pretty similar as the rest of them. What have you found, Joe, through the course of your career? Are there certain characteristics that the really good teams have that maybe the teams that aren't having that kind of success have? Are there, are there traits that you have to have, things in the locker room that need to go right for a team to go deep into the playoffs to win a Super Bowl, in fact? Well, you have to be tough. You have to, you know, you have to be smart. Um, but besides that, uh, kind of just like what I talked about, you have to be challenged. You have to go through some kind of tough time um, to know that you can get through it and to gain that confidence, you know, as a as a group. And it brings you together. And I think the more that you can be challenged and 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 you know go through tough circumstances, uh, the more prepared you are for the really tough games. Joe, what kind of game do you have right now? Twenty twenty one. 14th year in the league. How do you feel physically? What can Eagles fans expect to see from you this year? Well, I feel really good physically, and as long as that can stay that way, I feel better than ever about playing quarterback in this league. Um, you know, I, I've seen most of what you can see, and, um, you know, I still have my arm and my ability to throw, and, um, you know, everything else, yeah, you know, I feel really good about. So I'm excited about what my body and what my mind can do, and i um, just got to go out there and, and show everybody else. Joe, how challenging was that neck injury for you just in terms of the context of your career and maybe the next step that you were going to take? Yeah, well, it was the biggest challenge was just mentally for me, um, just going through the ups and downs of, you know, what what was going to happen if I was going to be able to play again, um, you know, not really knowing, kind of having it be out of my hands to a certain extent, um, and and ultimately not not being ready to to be done with it um, and and not having really too much of a choice in it. So that wasn't a tough, wasn't an easy thing to deal with, but, you know, we all, we all get through it. And, uh, you know, I'm excited as to where it brought me today. Why are you still in the game, Joe? What, what about the game of football do you still love? Well, it's most, it, it's, it's what I know. It's what I've been doing for, you know, forever. Uh, and I still feel like I can do it. So I owe it to myself to go out there and do it. I, I, I love the game, you know, and, I love my family. I, I want them to, you know, I want them to see me play. I also don't know if I can be at home too long with five kids and, and my wife driving me crazy, you know, after about 10 minutes. My patient is going, is, is I'm losing my patience. So to have something to go to that I love to do it, it, is a lot of fun. You met with Nick Sirianni. You met with Shane. You met with the coaches. Uh, you walked through the Novacare complex. What kind of vibe did you get from that environment? 
Yeah, I feel like everybody's excited. I feel like everybody's eager to kind of get football started and get going to work. And I think they're excited about what the opportunity may be and how this season's going to turn out. So you could definitely feel that around the building and it, it, it makes you ready to go. And Joe, your mindset coming into this situation? Ah, listen, I'm, I'm here to play football, and that's my mindset. I, I can't wait to go out there and play football and compete with the guys and have a lot of fun and, um, and you know, and see where this season brings us. Joe Flacco, thank you so much. Welcome back to Philadelphia as a Philadelphia Eagle. Looking forward to seeing you in 2021. I appreciate it, Dave. All right, now let's get to what everyone is talking about. Did the Eagles make the right move when they traded their first-round pick number six overall, as well as a fifth round pick to the Miami Dolphins in exchange for the 12th pick in the draft this year, a fourth round pick, number 123 overall, and Miami's original first round draft pick in 2022. Let's get some perspective from the NFL insiders. Adam Kaplan, Sirius XM, NFL Radio, as well as his podcast. He's got a great one, he and Jeff Mosher, called Inside the Birds. Adam is in the know, not only with the Eagles, but around the NFL. And he says, well, let's take a listen. Adam Kaplan joins the show. Adam, we've had some time now to kind of digest this trade, what it means, the value. And let's recap. The Eagles trade out of number six. They move back to number 12. They give up a fifth-round draft pick as well. They get a fourth-round pick, the 12th pick overall, as well as a first-round pick from Miami, Miami's original pick in 2022. So I don't know, is it the Jimmy Johnson chart or whatever the value here is, your take on this deal? Yeah, look, by the, in fact, the updated Jimmy Johnson point chart, they absolutely got a fair value, actually good value. It's just that I understand, as I know you're well aware of, fans were hoping for Jamar Chase or Kyle Pitts. Well, uh, that's out the door now. That the, the Eagles move from 6 to 12. But I will tell you, I've already done a little bit of a mock draft, and we know the Eagles need corners. At, corners who can play on the outside. There's going to be a good corner at 12 that's available if the Eagles, by the way, stay there. They're, they're, just good, they're going to be good players. In fact, they're going to be a day one starters, which is what you're looking for. And now you've got the extra first-round pick for next year, and obviously with the Carson Wentz trade, the the – possibility of getting a second one for next season. All right, well, let's back up to the, that, that, that chart, that value chart. Is this fair value or is this outstanding value for the trade? I would say good value. Um, I had someone send me it. Um, actually, it wasn't this trade. It was for another trade. I was asking uh, an analytics person uh, in the NFL uh, it was a while back, and I still have it in my phone, and I was looking at it. Okay, yeah, this this looks good. And, and on on the our show, uh, Jeff Mosher and I, Jeff also did the same thing. Uh, it's called Inside the Birds. Jeff had, had asked somebody, and we we had similar information. But and, and here's the thing: why you, you make trades like this, it's, you know, and, and you, you you do it knowing that you're going to get someone good at twelve. When you're a team that's coming off a four eleven one season, you you, ha- you need you have so many needs. This helps you do that. This helps you get better faster. With more, with not only uh, first round picks, you move up as you said from the fifth round to the fourth round. Uh, when in that pick exchange, you've got the extra pick first round or next season, and this is just an important draft. I mean, you got to do something. You, now we'll see what they do with the eleven picks, whether they they actually have them all. But the good thing is the Eagles have a lot of flexibility right now. I, I Adam, you know, you mentioned the fan reaction, and I get it, and, and the media reaction. Yep initially was like, oh, my gosh, in Philadelphia anyway, oh, my gosh, you've moved from 6 to 12. You've just given up the idea of getting that, quote, premier Hey, I had the same reaction. I'm not going to lie. I was like, wait a minute, what are they doing here? But when I did, you know, I asked a lot of people I trust in the the NFL in personnel, and I was was saying, hey, who could be around here? And I was looking at the group of players, and I'm like, wow, that's a good group. As a matter of fact, there's, as Dave, as you know, when um, when you grade first round picks, there's typically only twelve to fifteen uh, in the first round, and the rest really should be second round picks. But thirty two picks have to be made, and that, that's just the way it is. So this year, I'm hearing fifteen to eighteen, depending on who you speak with. But anyway, so again, I think there's some pretty good value there. 
and with all these quarterbacks being overvalued, the Eagles will have a chance to get a prime player. So you think cornerback is a possibility? How about wide receiver, Adam? If, if, if Eagles fans did, in fact, have their hearts set on Jamar Chase or the tight end Kyle Pitts from Florida, who, who knows where he's going to go, but he certainly has tested out very impressively. There's another wave here. Like, look, Devonta Smith wins his Heisman Trophy. Jalen Waddell, superstar talent from Alabama. I mean, there are going to be players at positions that are exciting to fans, in addition to cornerback, that the Eagles are going to have an opportunity to select. Yeah, no, no doubt. Now, Waddell is a higher-graded player uh, than Smith. Both are outstanding. And then we didn't mention offensive line, Rashawn Slater from uh, Northwestern, who's a terrific football player. He is a guy that probably is going to be a guard uh, at the next level. Uh, He could play tackle for sure, but I think at the next level, he's a a day one starter. See, the thing at number 12 is anyone you draft there uh, is seen as a day one starter, whether it's a Slater, whether it's a wide receiver or corner. There's going to be a player that they, they will take that will start day one. Adam, I'd like to finish it with this little note. Um, Miami. And we're all going to root against the Miami Dolphins in 2022. I'm you sorry, are, I'm not. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm talking from the Eagles' perspective here. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> hey, hey, Eagles fans, we don't want the Miami Dolphins to win in 2021. Got it. And I got to tell you, man, I just I know that they had they've showed a lot of progress last year, and I just I guess I'm just not a believer in Tua at the quarterback position. Your thoughts? Well, Dave, here's the thing: there's no Ryan Fitzpatrick to save the day. Put on Superman cape. He's going to be playing against you guys uh, with with Washington this season. Yeah, look, Tua was pulled twice last season, would have been pulled a third time if Fitzpatrick was not on the COVID list week 17 against Buffalo, where they got blown out, Tua did not play well. So I understand it. I get it. And, and by the way, with, with the Dolphins, I know they're not going to select the quarterback in round one. Who knows? Uh, based on the way they yo-yoed him last season, it wouldn't surprise me if they selected a quarterback in round two or three. So uh, the Dolphins will be solid because they play very good defense. But I'm agreeing with you. They were they were ten and six last season. They're not a lot to make the playoffs, based on the roster. But again, we're in early April here, not in September. Based on the roster, based on the fact that the AFC East all of a sudden Buffalo, as a great team, the Patriots are set to bounce back. They've been so active in free agency. The Jets with that second pick overall, maybe and a draft class from 2020 that they like. I'm just saying, Adam. I'm just. I'm wishing and I'm saying, don't, 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 don't think Miami's going to be all that great this year. I, oh, I, I just, I just, I think that they sold their, they sold their souls back in the '70s, undefeated season, Super Bowls, <laughs> and since then they're they're a franchise that's just not going to do it for you. Well, we'll see what happens, but um, it's it, this is one of the most interesting off seasons for the Eagles. Uh, quarterback situation is fascinating. Uh, 11 draft picks right now. They're loaded. Fans love the draft. We get it. I can't wait to see what they do. Would you give me a name right now? If you, if I had to, if I pressed you on and said, Adam, who will the Eagles take at number 12? What, what would your answer be? Does it have, can I give you three names? Sure. Uh, J.C. Horn, Devontae Smith, Rashawn Slater. And so, Eagles fans, if you were thinking of those players at six, right? Like, it's not that different. The names are kind of the same. The value, right, Dave, the value is still there. Now, it's not Pitts or Chase. Let's let's be let's be straight about this. It's not Pitts or Chase. So you're not going to get those players there. But you're getting day one starters, terrific talents, and, and, by, and there, there are going to be some other players that, that, that drop. And also, let me also mention this, at 12. If Pitt, not Chase will not, but if, if Pitts drops down to like 9 or 10, or, or, or a player that the Eagles like, their front office likes, the Eagles have so much ammo this year, they could trade up. I'm not ruling anything out at this point, my friend. Oh, I, I, I agree. I, I think that the, the Eagles have the ability to go up, to go, they can go back even further. They, they have given themselves a lot of flexibility. Okay, Adam, last one, and I lied. I said that earlier, but this is truly the last one. Eagles, sure. uh, the NFL adds the 17th seed, the 17th game. Eagles get the Jets. Eagles, you know, on paper right now have this schedule that is like not. It, it, I guess it's rated as the easiest in the NFL. I mean, your <laughs> thoughts early is that we don't know the who, what, where, and why, and all that, but we 
we know that the opponents. I mean, your thoughts on on adding that 17th game and adding it as the New York Jets? Yeah, it is weird this this flexible schedule. Um, we also have the flex Monday night schedule late in the season, which which is great for ESPN. It's a little bit odd, you know. I'm, I'm, you and I are in similar ages. We we grew up um, in a, actually a 14 game season that moved to 16 games. Now we have 17 games. We had the extra wild card, which we should mention was very well received around the National Football League, and also with fans, we like to have an extra wild card. This is just something different. Uh, the way that they're doing it is certainly different. Remember, Dave, the Super Bowl will be, will be one week later in, in 2022, uh, mid-February now, which is certainly odd. I mean, it's just an adjustment. But the good thing is I like what the commissioner said. He's, we should mention he's also expecting full stadiums this fall, so let's cross our fingers there. Oh, I can't wait. Adam Kaplan, as always, thank you so much. Thank you. And we can't give you just one perspective. We've got to give you two Ross Tucker, Ross Tucker Podcast, NFL Radio, Sirius XM NFL Radio, former NFL player. He knows his way around the league a little bit, huh? Also does the Eagles preseason games as a color analyst, so we look forward to seeing Ross and hearing Ross this summer. Preseason, yes, is on the schedule. Ross Tucker joins me right now on the Eagles Insider Podcast. Ross, we've had some time to think about the trade the Eagles made to get out of the sixth spot moved back to 12. What has that perspective shown you? What kind of light do you have to shine on the trade the Eagles made? I love it. And I'm a little bit surprised, Dave, that there are, are any people out there that don't love it. I, I guess I understand a lot of fans at six, you know, had their heart set on maybe a guy like Jamar Chase, who they think might be there at six. And I suppose I understand that, Dave, but man, I mean, they're going to go down to 12 and get a guy that they would have strongly considered at six, still be able to get, in my mind, one of the top three receivers, perhaps even the number one corner, both of which are huge needs for the Eagles, and to pick up a first-round pick next year from the Dolphins. And by the way, Dave, the, the jury's kind of still out on Tua Tungo Vialoa. I mean, that might end up being a mid-first-round pick, maybe even a little bit better than that. So, I just think the value is incredible for the Eagles to just move down from 6 to 12, pick up that extra first-round pick next year. They might end up having three of them. I'm a little surprised, frankly, that the Dolphins did the trade. I mean, if you're the Dolphins, who are you to be giving up next year's first-round pick just to move up from 12 to 6? You better hope that the guy you really, really want is there. Ross, the strategy clearly with the Eagles is build through the draft, right? Trading Carson. Uh, 20 picks in the next two uh, drafts. Your your thoughts on just the, the rebuilding process. Every team goes through a down period. The good teams, the good organizations are the ones that come back quickly. How, how much can the Eagles turn this thing around with two strong drafts? Well, here's the thing. Uh, you're right. They do have the most draft picks the next couple of years. And I know that Jeffrey Laurie has talked about it being a transition year. I don't think that they're going to be as bad, Dave, as other people seem to think they're going to be. I mean, if if they stay healthy along the offensive line and guys like Brandon Brooks and Lane Johnson come back, they're going to be really good up front both sides of the ball. I mean, look at their O-line. Look at their D-line. I don't think the skill guys, the young skill guys are going to be worse than they were last year. You'd have to expect that they would only get better. And we all know that it's going to be a huge year for Jalen Hurts, and we're not sure what he's going to be able to give them at the quarterback position. But it's hard for me to imagine that he could be any worse than what they got from the quarterback position last year. I mean, if they just got competent quarterback play last year, they'd probably go 8-8 eight and eight and win the division. And I think behind that offensive line and with this defensive line still having Hargrave who came on at the end of the year and Barnett and Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham and Josh Sweat, I just think the Eagles are going to be better this year than people think. And I love the strategy of having the likely three first-round picks next year. Either Jalen Hurts shows he's the guy and you can start to build an unbelievable team around him or – He's not the guy, and you have the ammo to either trade up and get the quarterback you want or maybe end up trading those first-round picks 
for a veteran quarterback. I mean, who knows where the Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson situations are a year from now. Hey, Ross, the Eagles certainly need to draft better than they've drafted. Uh, your thoughts on, on where this team might target, not just 12, but throughout the draft. What do you identify as needs here? Yeah, well, you're right. They had not drafted as well as they needed to the last couple of years. And I think a lot of people, you, you have to hit on your ones, Dave, right? And with Andre Dillard, Jalen Rager, the jury's still very much out. Obviously, even Ortega Whiteside, those are high picks. And obviously, the fans can and should point to players taken after them or other players the Eagles could have taken that have shown themselves to be much better players. Um, I think they're going to do a couple things. I think, number one, I think they will get a corner probably early. I wouldn't be surprised if they drafted a safety as well. I know that organizationally they don't tend to invest a ton at linebacker. And I think a lot of it depends on how they feel about Davion Taylor and Sean Bradley, a couple of young guys they took last year. I do think, though, they're going to continue to – bring in some bodies on the O-line and D-line. I mean, Fletcher Cox is not getting any younger. Neither is Brandon Graham. On the right side of the offensive line, guys like Brandon Brooks and Lane Johnson, even Jason Kelsey. I think that the Eagles are forward-thinking enough that they realize they need to kind of replenish the troops a little bit in case you know some of these guys only play another year or two. Ross, I, li- I like the optimism. It's, it's not as bad as some in Philadelphia painting. It's amazing – how negative the reaction was after that trade down to 12. It, it was, it was the, the idea that you give up so much moving from six to 12. I, I just don't understand that. That's philosophy. Well, so here's the deal. Okay. Eagles fans have a right to be tremendously disappointed and frustrated by the 2020 season. There's no question about it. And to go from where we were a year ago, Dave, where you and I, we would talk about it. The only two things we felt good about, for sure, for a decade going forward, were the head coach and the quarterback. And now they're both gone. So Eagles fans have every right to be frustrated, angry, all of those things. This trade from 6 to 12 is not one of them. I mean, this trade from 6 to 12 is amazing, and I love it. They're going to either get the number one corner or maybe the number one linebacker or one of the top three receivers, probably not Jamar Chase, but one of the two Alabama kids, and they get a first-round pick next year, which could end up being very high. You know, people in general, and this is no fault of their own, but fans are not typically, Dave, and you know this, as forward-thinking in terms of the future as the organization has to be right. Like the fans just want players. Now they want to win. Now they want the better player that they've heard of more. Now think about next year. We'll, we'll have this conversation again next year before the draft. And I think Eagles fans will be singing a, a very much a different tune. They'll be so happy that the Eagles have what I believe will be three first round picks at that point. Well, that will do it for this Eagles Insider Podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Hope you all enjoyed that. That was a great episode. Really enjoyed that one. Thanks to Peter Kelly, Trevor Hayes, and Ray Doyle for their work. Thanks to all of you for joining each and every week, each and every episode. If you have a moment to give us a rating, we love them. There's a link in the details section of your podcast library. We're inching closer to the NFL Draft April 29th through May 1st. Make sure you're with us on PhiladelphiaEagles.com, our social platforms, our app, as we bring you live coverage from the NovaCare Complex. I'm Eagles insider Dave Spadaro. Thanks for joining me, everyone. Have yourselves a great Eagles day, and as always, fly, Eagles, fly. E-A-T-L-E-S, Eagles! Hi, I'm Fran Duffy, host of the Journey to the Draft podcast, where every week we're going through scouting reports, big boards, mock drafts, and figuring out how prospects transition to the NFL. Listen to the Journey to the Draft podcast wherever podcasts can be found. 